So to begin, I thought I would play the Lord's Prayer. Familiar to most of us in this room, I think. This is the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, actually Syriac, which is a, a version of the language Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus spoke. So as you listen to this, you might just close your eyes and imagine that you're on a hill, a mount, if you will, in Israel, 2,000 years ago, and you are sitting on the ground listening to a man talk. And in the middle of his talk, he recites this prayer. Amen. There probably wasn't that chanting going on in the background at the time. So that's the Lord's Prayer in Syriac, the closest thing that we have to the Aramaic that Jesus uh, used to speak. At that time, uh, Hebrew was already a dead language in Israel. Um, it had been because of invasions, occupations of the country, all sorts of historical uh, events. Hebrew had been eclipsed by um, Aramaic, the language of Syria to the north other parts around Israel. Uh, people also spoke Greek in Israel at the time, mostly for trade and commerce because the people uh, uh, that was part of the uh, Roman Empire and Koina or common Greek was the uh, main language of communication within the empire, more than Latin, which was really just for Italy primarily. Uh, so we don't know if Jesus knew Greek or not. He might have. Um, and we're not sure if he really understood Hebrew either. Uh, he was, uh, but certainly would have spoken at least Aramaic. We don't know if he was literate either. And uh, I thought we would read a passage in the, in the Bible that illustrates this whole issue about whether or not Jesus was literate in any language, able to read and write, read and write at all. And it comes from the Gospel of John in the New Testament. Okay. John chapter 8. Who would like to read this? You volunteers. Like you do. Oh, yeah. yeah, from there to through verse 11. Through verse 11, okay. Uh, then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to her, to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept, question, kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone who is among you, anyone among you who is without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, sir. 
And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go on your way, and from now on do not sin again. Now this passage, thank you, perfect. This passage is, uh, is one of the most famous and beloved passages in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Uh, but you'll find in many Bibles that this whole chunk isn't there. It's in the footnotes. Because this passage, so beloved by Christians everywhere, uh, is not to be found in the earliest texts, the most reliable sources, if you will, of the Greek New Testament. Uh, it was in the Latin version of the Bible uh, called the Vulgate, uh, which was produced by the early church and survives, you know, survived for many, many years as the standard version of the of the Bible, in Latin. So it was in there, and it was, you know, it's still part of the tradition. But I think it illustrates this passage, this beautiful passage, illustrates a lot about the origins of Christianity, the origins of the Bible, and and it, it leaves us with more questions than answers. It's a wonderful story for one thing, obviously, and it's like, what was Jesus writing? What do you think he was writing? What was he doing with his finger on the ground? Any speculations? If you had been in that situation, in his position, what would you have been doing with your finger in the dust on the ground? There's, there's, all, there's all sorts of great speculations about this. One that I really love is that Jesus is making a list of uh, all the men who were present in that circle about to stone this woman who'd actually slept with her. <laughs> but that's pure, it's pure speculation. It's, it's fun speculation. But we don't know. You know, no, there's, there's no answer to that question, really. Uh, any more than there's an answer to the question of whether it actually happened, whether it really belongs in the Bible, in the canon of Scripture or not, really. Um, it leaves us with a lot of questions. But it's still this compelling, powerful story, isn't it? I mean, it's just so profound. And this message of, of forgiveness and of uh, forbearance and mercy is, uh, lives on. Lives on in the tradition and is a powerful part of Christianity. So whether or not it was supposed to be in the Bible, whether or not it happened historically, up in the air, open question, but the story has power. And it's part of a tradition that... Uh, is alive, a living tradition today. Uh, the approach I'm taking in this class today is, uh, and for these uh, many weeks, is going to be to look at Christian history through the lens of Christian spirituality, Christian spiritual practices. And so each week we're going to do some spiritual practice of various kinds. Uh, that represent practices from different parts of the history of the church. And we're also going to learn um, about this history, uh, particularly from the point of view of phenomenology. Phenomenology is about the experiential aspects of a religion, right? more than the dogma or the doctrine of the religion. It's the, it's the, the guts, uh, the heart, if you will, in a way, of, of the faith, as it's practiced. So we'll be looking particularly at a phenomenological approach to the, to the history of Christianity. But you're going to get history of the church with this spirituality and phenomenology. Uh, we're going to learn about doctrines, but we're not going to be teaching just one set of dog, uh, doctrines or dogma about uh, the belief system of the church. Nor am I going to prejudice that there's one that should be followed. Uh, a disclaimer here, that I have to give you is about myself. Uh, it's inevitable that the teacher gets into the subject that is being taught. So, my confession. Um, I bring to this study my own point of view, which is that I'm a progressive Christian. By that I mean we're Christians, we're a sect, if you will, of Christianity, a, a variation or a form of Christianity. Um, mostly to be, to be found out of the uh, Protestant tradition, but there are lots of progressive uh, Catholics as well. Um, 
And it's a point of view that suggests that Christianity is mostly about practice and behavior more than it is about dogma and doctrine. Uh, it's a form of the church, of the Christian tradition, that does not presume um, that Christianity is superior to all other religions. It assumes that other religions may be as good for others as Christianity is good for Christians. Um, now, it doesn't suggest that all religions are the same or they're equal or any of that. It's not relativistic in that sense, but it, it certainly uh, does not make a claim to superiority to other faiths. Uh, progressive Christians generally look at the Bible as a product of people. It's, it's humans record of their encounter with the divine or ultimate reality as opposed to being God's word delivered through some kind of special revelation, a final statement of what God wants and who God is. Uh, progressive Christians generally don't look at it that way. They look at the Bible as um, a treasure, a spiritual treasure uh, to be looked at primarily in the way you would look, something like in the way you would look at poetry. I like to say, whenever you hear me say the word God, you are hearing poetry. It's not about facts in the sense that we think of uh, facts today. Um, it's not about history, according to the standards today that we have for history. It's um, an expression of our deepest spiritual yearnings and experience, and Christianity is a language for that. And I would say generally progressive Christians would look at Christian faith as a language as opposed to a prescription about how you're supposed to think and what you're supposed to believe. And of course, that metaphor of language suggests that there are lots of languages, right? Other religions uh, that, again, are as good for other people to use as languages for their spiritual experience as Christianity is for Christians. Uh, now, I'm not here to promote my point of view or my sect of Christianity, but you do need to know where I'm coming from as, as I talk, and it does certainly color the type of study that we're having here on Christian spiritual practices. So we're going to practice practices that come from traditions different than my own within Christianity and points of view different uh, than my own as we go through. And uh, throughout the class, I hope you all speak up anytime. Just speak up if you got a question or a comment. Don't hesitate. This is a small group. It's a seminar. It's informal. There's no homework. There's no tests. There's no papers. So we're in this together. And uh, if you have opinions about how this ought to proceed, please speak up. Help guide us uh, to be a good experience for all of us. Um, so today we're looking at the Bible. And we're looking at it as a, uh, a means for spiritual practice. Yes? Again, you can look at the Bible many ways, and it's, it's been seen in many lights in many ways through the history of Christianity, and of course into the, uh, uh, the Hebrew tradition, the Jewish tradition, uh, that has an amazing uh, history of how people view the, the Hebrew uh, Bible and the Hebrew Scriptures. A very deep history of interpretation and also a history of the spiritual use of, of these texts uh, for spiritual practice, spiritual disciplines. Um, I thought maybe we'd do a practice right now, which is a chant. Yes? And, and the one I'd, I'd like to introduce you to is uh, a Kyrie. Now this is in Greek. Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. Christe eleison, Christ have mercy. And this is a very ancient Christian chant, probably dating back to the very earliest days of the church. It's in Greek. And uh, there were, I'm sure, many forms of this chant, uh, many tunes uh, for the chant. But it's a simple spiritual discipline to to uh, utter this line. Um, and it's taken many forms, these words, uh, not just in Greek, in the beautiful uh, Kyrie's of, the, of uh, the Greek tradition of Christianity, the Eastern Orthodox tradition, um, 
but this it's also the, the root of what's known as the Jesus Prayer. Any of you ever read uh, Franny and Zooey? Wonderful novel by Salinger. Great book. It's actually a deeply spiritual book. It's a novel in the 1950s in America called uh, um, Franny and Zooey. Anyway, one of the, the, char the, the boy character in, the, in this book uh, gets into the Jesus Prayer. And the Jesus Prayer is, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. Period. That's it. And uh, throughout the history of uh, Christianity, people have used this prayer as, a, as, a, as what the Hindus would call a mantra, right? a repetitious phrase. It can be sung, it can be just recited. Um, but the Hesychasts, the, uh, the, the monks, the, uh, uh, the desert monks of the Eastern tradition of Christianity, would repeat this prayer all the time, night and day. Get into their brains and their and their bodies, really, to the point where it would just repeat itself over and over and over and over, and over again. Identical concept to the Hindu concept of the mantra. Um, as a a channel for uh, the spirit for God to move through you, the uh, the chant is a, a vehicle for uh, spirituality to well up from within. There's a lot more to it than I just said. This is an opener. So this chant goes way back. And we know it's old because um, in the Latin mass, it's sung in Greek, okay? So we know that this is, a, you know, this was a part of the liturgy, the worship service of early Christians from, from the beginning. So here's one version of it. I happen to like this version because it's in, uh, it was made famous by uh, a movie called Easy Rider. Everybody, anybody ever see that? Famous movie from the 70s about uh, a couple of motorcycle riding characters and they, as they're going through Louisiana in the background, there's a version of this, a rock version of the Kitty Day. I like it. So, so why don't we, again, close our eyes just to be able to pay more attention and, and relax into this experience. And I'll do it a few times and then when you're ready, join me. There's a minor tone to that, a uh, Eastern tone to that music, and, and that's uh, very that's that's how it sounded. You notice that in the Avon prayer, the, the Lord's prayer as well. There's a there's a um, the tonal scale of Eastern music is, is different than that of Western music, and it's, it helps you to imagine your you know kind of feel your way into the experience the sounds of early Christianity. 
you know, the, the uh, Eastern tones. And you'll find that kind of music in uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, in its many forms, Greek Orthodoxy, Russian Orthodoxy, Syrian Orthodoxy. Uh, you'll also hear that type of music, the, the tonal music of uh, the Coptic traditions, that would be the uh, Egyptian Coptics and the uh, Ethiopian Coptic Church, all have a similar liturgy and a very similar kind of tonal music. Very ancient, uh, deeply rooted in the earliest days of Christianity. Uh, but you might think about this week um, trying out the Jesus Prayer. Let's try it now. And I'm, I'm just, I'll repeat it. You don't have to repeat it after me. But I'll repeat it a bunch of times and see if you can just let it in. And you think about the word mercy, um, that has a lot of meanings. I think it, it's about, um, mercy is about forgiveness, it's about openness, it's about release of guilt, it's about release of anger. It's about an openness to uh, kindness and compassion. And this prayer, is, uh, it can have many meanings. And the ones I'm suggesting are just the tip of the iceberg, really. But it's, uh, I think the power of this, of this prayer, of this uh, practice, is it's how ancient it is, how far back it goes. It really puts us in touch with the spiritual experience of the earliest Christians. So I'll repeat it a few times. And during the week, try it out. See if you can repeat this. And let it mean whatever it means for you. No fixed meaning here. And let it do whatever it's going to do to you and through you during the week. And see if you can uh, have an experience of this as a mantra. That, uh, that uh, gives you focus, puts you in touch with uh, your present state, your present place, your present feelings, your present thoughts. Let it be a means of grounding for your uh, your soul. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. 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 You can repeat it aloud to yourself until it repeats itself for itself in your, in your mind in your heart Lord Jesus Christ have mercy upon me 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 how did that feel? Any reactions or feelings to that or responses? It's very centering. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so what does that mean for you, centering? I guess um, kind of a sense of withdrawing from the world, but opening. Withdrawing and opening at the same time. Yeah. Any other experiences? I feel that it's sort of like a weight like a calm uh, sort of like uh, okay getting all this like mercy <laughs> um it's it's very um the weight is very like you can think of it as a as a like it's a burdening but at the same time it's like it's uplifting uh, because it's it's like a good type of weight you know okay but if there's a heaviness about yeah it, exactly oh really interesting any other initial hits on this? Well, try it out during the week if you want, and we'll report back next week and see how it went. Yeah, and sometime read Franny and Zoe. It's wonderful, wonderful. And the effects that it has on, on this uh, young man is the stories he tells. There's another wonderful book called, that's all about the Jesus Prayer. The book is called uh, The Way of the Pilgrim. Anybody read that again? 
That is a classic of, of, of Christian spirituality. I'm going to send you guys stuff too. Mm -hmm. Worry not about this. Sweet. One. The reading list will be coming your way. Some of it's on, online, but uh, The Way of the Pilgrim is a really profound book too. Um, it's about a Russian um, guy who just is sort of a lay monk, essentially. Gives up his worldly possessions, his job, his home, wanders all over Russia, doing nothing but repeating the Jesus prayer aloud and in his head. It just becomes the background noise, the theme song of his life. But because of the effect it has on him, he ends up doing all sorts of profound acts of service for people around him. And, and the book is all about these moments of listening and caring and compassion opening that happen as a consequence you know, in his relationships with the people he meets along the way. It's just a, a real profound, one of the great uh, classic works of Christian spirituality. A bit about the Bible. Again, you know, this, this chant, uh, uh, this is an example of, the, you know, the mantra tradition. The scripture is used this way. And chanting that, that bit of music, uh, it helps to know that the Bible, the Old Testament, which is the Hebrew Scriptures, as well as the New Testament, they started out as oral traditions. They were not originally written down, as you probably already know. So they started out as oral traditions, and throughout the world, you'll notice that in oral traditions, people chant the stories and the poems. There's a bit of music, if you will to the recitations. Um, and this, you'll find this around the world, you'll find it in other religions. And uh, in Islam, of course, you have um, the beautiful tradition of reading the, the Quran. And if you listen, if you listen to um, an imam or a, someone else reading from the Quran or reciting the Quran in a mosque, the way it sounds, just you close your eyes and listen and what you're really, you're listening to pretty much how it would have sounded, very close to how it sounded for the uh, people of Israel uh, to recite their scriptures before printing, before writing, before any of it was written down. Um, because music helps you remember. That's why we sing the ABCs, right? No different, same thing. So there's this oral tradition, uh, a lot of it was musical in nature, um, still to this day there's a tradition called plain song, where uh, in particular the Episcopal Church and some Catholic churches they use plain song as a way of reciting the psalms, which were psalms, they were meant to be sung anyway, a way of reciting the psalms in a very mantra or spiritually focused kind of way, using just very simple uh, very simple, um, tall structure in the chant, the chanting way of reading, reading the scripture. So yeah, the original um, hearers of the word, uh, of the words of the uh, Hebrew traditions, scriptures, they would have heard a bit of a bit of a bit of sing song in the voice. Um, a lot of it, in fact, you know, again, the Psalms themselves four songs meant to be sung. So you have this oral tradition, it's very ancient. Um, the Christian Bible uh, is made up, of course, of the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures and the, and the New Testament. Also in many Bibles you'll find what's called the Apocrypha, which is another body of work of uh, sacred writings from the Hebrew tradition that uh, have been included in the Christian Bible because they relate to, uh, um, they're important for understanding particularly the uh, apocalyptic traditions of uh, Christianity. So we have in the Bible a collection of books uh, that started out as oral traditions. Uh, you've got the Torah, which is the first five, the first five books of the, of the um, Hebrew scriptures, very old, um, they, uh, no one knows quite how old they are, of course, because of the oral nature of the way they were transmitted. Uh, very, very ancient stories. Uh, written down, 
finally have been made a, a kind of a canonical scripture around uh, the time of the Babylonian exile. So that's, uh, when is that? Sixth century, fifth century BC? That's about the time that it, uh, it gets written down. Um, yeah, sixth century BC. Uh, but there are parts of the Bible that are clearly uh, much older than that. Uh, the book of Job, for example. Now, it too was uh, probably written down in the fifth century BC, but um, or somewhere between the fourth and the seventh, seventh and the fourth uh, centuries BC. But the material in it is thousands of years old. It comes from it comes from Babylonia, Sumerian civilization. It's uh, 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 you know just as ancient as any as any as any literature is. That's uh, really among the, the oldest. Uh, it makes references. There are passages in the Book of Job that are clearly making reference to uh, Sumerian traditions. So it's really, really old. And uh, the theological ideas in it are, are ancient. Um, and if you look through the Hebrew Scriptures, you see that there, there's not one theology at all. There are multiple interpretations of who God is, uh, multiple names for God, uh, multiple ideas about who Satan was, for example. That's a fascinating study. Anybody here study the history of Satan? A little bit. Yeah. 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 There's a great book out by uh, uh, Elaine Pagels on the history of Satan, which I commend to you. And that's actually a terrific book because it's a great window into just the, the whole story of the, of the Hebrew Scriptures. And it turns out there are multiple ideas of Satan in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, and all the way into Christianity, Christian scriptures as well. Uh, it's not one simple, clear character with a specific MO at all. You know, this is a, it takes many different forms. Would you say these multiple traditions are more a function of the time course over which they developed, or does it reflect yes. plural, pluralism at a given moment in time, or both? It's, it's, uh, it, it's a bit of both. But I would say it's it's an evolution of, you know, Satan, as Christians kind of traditionally think of him, um, is a a creation of, of the Judeo-Christian tradition over a very long time, all the way into the, medie the medieval era and past it. You know, the American Christian idea of Satan didn't really congeal until the late Middle Ages, really. Um, so. But the point here is that you've got all sorts of different points of view within the Hebrew Scriptures about the nature of God and um, and about how people are to live. What their uh, you know the the uh, the value system of uh, the Book of Ecclesiastes is very very different than the value system of the Book of Leviticus, for example. Have fun reading the two if you have the time and the patience. Sure. But but it's pretty different. You have a, in Ecclesiastes, you have a kind of a fatalistic worldview, and in Leviticus, you have a very legalistic, rule-bound worldview with a, a certain expression of Judaism at the time. So there's a lot of pluralism of theology in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, part of this is a reflection of, of the um, multiple authorship of, of these uh, Scriptures, certainly in the Torah, the first five books you have. Uh, four different versions of those books that were brought together, edited together in the uh, uh, during the Babylonian Empire to, to produce the books that we have today, the canonical, official, if you will, version of the Torah. Uh, and they have different, very different theologies, really. But these different strands, that explains some of the peculiarities in the text. Where, you know, the, the Bible starts with something very peculiar, of course, which is there are two versions of the creation story in the first in the first chapters of Genesis. Two quite different, divergent creation stories, um, and that's because there are two versions of the story that got pushed together, and they weren't even reconciled when they were pushed together. They were just combined in the same book. So. You have a, a in the Bible, all of it really is a collection of writings 
by people who had no idea that their writings were going to be combined into what we now call the Bible. There was no concept of that in the minds of anybody who was participating either in the oral tradition or in the written version of the later of, of these scriptures. Uh, so the, the canon, the canon of scripture, that means the official list of what's in and defining what, uh, what the scriptures are, uh, it developed very slowly for the Jewish tradition, um, what, what's now included in the Hebrew scriptures took a long time to develop. In Christianity, uh, that was a very slow process, the development of the canon as well. The, the Gospels started out as oral tradition, too. It wasn't written down. We don't think the best scholarship suggests, suggests that it took quite a while before any of it was written down. Uh, the best uh, estimate of the uh, scholars is that there were oral traditions of Jesus' sayings, what Jesus said, um, his parables, his aphorisms, that there, were, there was an oral tradition of that. Um, an oral tradition, of the, so that was one body of material. Then there were oral traditions about what he did, and what the events were of the Gospel stories. But these really didn't start to get written down until about A.D. 50. Uh, you know, quite a while after Jesus' death, his crucifixion. Uh, and so, and then the, the earliest uh, books of the New Testament, the letters of Paul, um, are the earliest texts. And, you know, it's not the, chrono the, the chronological order of the New Testament texts does not correspond with when they were written at all. Right? So the books of uh, the letters of Paul were very early, uh, of course, all written after Jesus' death, but not terribly long after. Uh, and what's in, but what's striking about those letters is that there's nothing in those letters about the gospel story. Nothing. Except um, the ritual of communion, the ritual of the breaking of the bread. Jesus did this. He broke the bread, he blessed the bread, he blessed the cup. Um, but there are no, there's no quotations of Jesus in the letters of Paul. Uh, no reference to his historical existence really at all in St. Paul's letters. So that's not much of a source about what Jesus did or said. Um, as far as outside evidence or, or attestation to the existence of Jesus, there's hardly any outside the Bible, outside the New Testament. So for instance, uh, the one of the very, you know, really the only record of Jesus' life outside the the gospel stories comes from uh, Flavius Josephus, who wrote a book called *The Antiquities*. After the fall of Jerusalem in, in 70 A.D., he wrote a book about the history of the Jews around the time, just you know, before Jesus and after Jesus and after the fall of Jerusalem. And in, in that book, he makes reference to a Jesus who was crucified. Period. That's it. Um, there's nothing else in first century literature outside of Christianity and its traditions that attests to the, to the existence of Jesus. So we're, we're left with not much by the standards, modern standards of history that would attest to Jesus or anything he said or did. Um, now another factor that comes up in the, in the reading the Gospels and understanding them, is that the uh, um, in the time of, of Jesus, in the first century, if you went to a library, you would notice, you and I would notice, that there was no fiction section or non-fiction section. Right? They didn't make those distinctions at that time. Uh, people freely confabulated stuff into otherwise seemingly historical accounts, including Josephus, uh, who made all sorts of really fantastic exaggerations about the size of armies and the scale of battles that just didn't make sense. You know, they don't make sense historically. Um, 
so there's uh, the point here is that well, what are we reading when we read these gospel stories? What are we reading in the New Testament? Uh, we're reading stories that were assembled by a community after the death of Jesus, mostly long after the death of Jesus. Uh, the book of John was written somewhere, put to, put to paper somewhere around 90 AD, a long time after uh, Jesus' life. So you're looking at um, the product of, of a spiritual community. Yes? By any standards that would be common to the current study of history. Uh, the amount that we can say with any certainty about who Jesus was and what he did is that he was a rabbi who got crucified. Somewhere around 33 AD. That's all we know. From there, there's a lot of speculation, right? And there are lots of different opinions. Let me uh, share with you this fascinating book, The Five Gospels. This is fun reading. This is um, the first, this is the four Gospels of the New Testament, plus another Gospel called the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas was probably the earliest text. Um, of all the records we have of Jesus. That was probably the earliest one in its more or less complete form. Gospel of Thomas is not a narrative. It's just a series of quotations of Jesus. Several of which, many of which, show up in the other four in the, in the other Gospels of the canonical New Testament. The Gospel of Thomas was not included in the canon of Scripture as it was determined somewhere around the 4th century. Um, but it's a very important document because uh, scholars are pretty sure it was very early and that it, that it contributed to the development of the other Gospels and that it was very, very important to the early Christian community, these, uh, these quotes, these aphorisms of Jesus. So the five Gospels, this is a book put together by a group of biblical scholars called the Jesus Seminar. Now these are scholars who are academic scholars. They are not... Um, pushing any dogma or doctrine at all. They're kind of anti-dogmatic, many of them. They're, they're basically academic professors, mostly of uh, biblical studies. And what they did as a group, they got this, this is a long-standing group, they um, rated all the sayings of Jesus by the likelihood that he might actually have said them. Okay? And they had a whole rubric for this about how they would... Uh, determine that. But the basic uh, uh, rubric was four categories in colors. You might have heard of the red letter edition of the Bible. Well, the red letter edition is an old idea in uh, Christianity. All the words of Jesus are in red. So this is a takeoff on that. So this is the New Testament Gospels and the Gospel of Thomas rated according to how likely it was Jesus said. Red, we think he we think the historical Jesus said it. Pink, uh, we think it, you know, there's a, a likelihood that he said it. Gray, not for sure, but it's an important part of early Christian tradition and an expression of Jesus' ideas, historical Jesus' point of view. Black, not. Black, uh, this is later interpolation. This is material put in later because of a certain theological acts that, that that aspect of the Christian community had to grind at the time. So, that's their rating system. And if you look through the book, you can see there's a lot of black and quite a bit of gray and some uh, purpley pink and hardly any red. Okay? So there's very little that these scholars believe is genuine words, really reliable words of Jesus. Now, of course, the problem with this is that, again, given the standards of modern historical criticism, <coughs> um, even these words in red you have to ask questions about because we have no, hardly any attestation to the, uh, the veracity of the story of Jesus at all outside this Christian community, which clearly 
and had a point of view and had a story to tell that uh, was developed to get a point across. And, and this is in a time when people are not terribly concerned about historical accuracy in the way that we think of it today at all. Include, well, I mean, one example is just the names of these Gospels. None of them correspond to the people who actually wrote them. You know, scholars, academic scholars of biblical history and biblical literature are in total agreement about that. John did not write the book of John. Matthew did not write the book of Matthew. Mark did not write the book of Mark. Now, uh, I think for some people hearing this, uh, that could be depressing. Right? No pink. I mean, you know, no red. Not enough red in here. Right? The historical Jesus. You know, very little we can count on. Maybe nothing we can count on about what he actually said or did. But there's at least one other way to look at this. And that is that what we have in the Gospels are crystalline, beautiful, profound works of literature about the soul and about the meaning of life and the purpose of life and about uh, what early Christianity was about, what it was for, what it meant, how it felt. So these are remarkable, really magical and, and amazing works of Ray. This is me giving an opinion, mind you. But, but I think that's another way to look at it. Um, it's my opinion, it's a lot of other people's opinion. It's another point of view. So what you're looking at is the spirituality of early Christianity when you're reading the Gospel stories and really the whole Christian scriptures, the whole body of Christian scriptures. Uh, quick, quick overview of um, a bit of biblical history here. Stick around if you want to look at these. we got the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew, right? Greek from back to front. You have the Greek New Testament. And this makes reference, this, this version is built on the, the most reliable or, or double-checked, uh, you know, uh, uh, texts from the earliest days of Christianity that match up. So, you know, there's a lot of cross-connecting between different versions, different copies of the New Testament. And that, all that 3D and that interlocking of these different texts, it's, it's kind of like detective work, right? Through that means, the scholars figure out which of these texts probably is the closest to the earliest Christian traditions. And that's what you find in this version of the Greek New Testament. Uh, the five Gospels, Gospel Parallels, this is uh, keeps track of, of the uh, synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are the stories that, about the story version of Jesus, the uh, narrative accounts. The book of John is much less of a narrative. It's much more theological, much more mystical, um, much more doctrinal, uh, and much less focused on the story of Jesus. Versions of the Bible, uh, I would commend to you uh, strongly the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. This is a translation from Greek and Hebrew, from the most reliable texts of Greek and Hebrew into English by scholars. Um, a translation, an important distinction. So it's, it's getting from, uh, from these texts to English, a readable version of English uh, based on the best scholarship, academic scholarship. Uh, the King James Version uh, is full of mistakes in terms of uh, its, its, its uh, translation of the Greek and Hebrew. Now it's based on, it is not based on the most reliable uh, ancient texts that, that we have in the scriptures, but it's a classic of, of English literature, right? So it's a treasure because of the use of language and the way that's woven into our yeah. culture. So it's an important book. Now, there are a lot of other Bibles that are mostly interpretations. And this is just something to understand about the Bible. Uh, evangelical Christians... We'll be there in a minute. Uh, evangelical Christians tend to use Bibles like the New American Standard, the Schofield Bible, uh, 
the New King James, the Good News Version, etc. It's important to notice these are interpretations, right? Based on the theology. So they've written the theology into the text, assuming that it's the truth and that that's what the Bible really means. But they're not, strictly speaking, they're not very accurate translations. They're actually highly inaccurate in many ways. So if you really want to kind of get at the early Christian experience,